Welcome to Audiobook Heaven. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens Chapter 19 In which a notable plan is discussed and determined on. It was a chill, damp, windy night when the Jew, buttoning his great coat tight round his shriveled body and pulling the collar up over his ears, so as completely to obscure the lower part of his face, emerged from his den. He paused on the step as the door was locked and chained behind him, and having listened while the boys made all secure, and until their retreating footsteps were no longer audible, slunk down the street as quickly as he could. The house to which Oliver had been conveyed was in the neighborhood of Whitechapel, the Jew stopped for an instant at the corner of the street, and, glancing suspiciously round, crossed the road and struck off in the direction of Spitalfields. The mud lay thick upon the stones, and a black mist hung over the streets. The rain fell sluggishly down, and everything felt cold and clammy to the touch. It seemed just the night when it befitted such a being as the Jew to be abroad. As he glided stealthily along, creeping beneath the shelter of the walls and doorways, the hideous old man seemed like some loathsome reptile, engendered in the slime and darkness through which he moved, crawling forth by night in search of some rich offal for a meal. He kept on his course, through many winding and narrow ways, until he reached Bethnal Green. Then, turning suddenly off to the left, he soon became involved in a maze of the mean and dirty streets which abound in that close and densely populated quarter. The Jew was evidently too familiar with the ground he traversed to be at all bewildered, either by the darkness of the night or the intricacies of the way. He hurried through several alleys and streets, and at length turned into one, lighted only by a single lamp at the farther end. At the door of a house in the street he knocked. Having exchanged a few muttered words with the person who opened it, he walked upstairs. A dog growled as he touched the handle of a room door, and a man's voice demanded who was there. "'Only me, Bill, only me, my dear,' said the Jew, looking in. "'Bring in your body, then,' said Sykes. Lie down, you stupid brute, don't you know the devil, when he's got a great coat on? Apparently the dog had been somewhat deceived by Mr. Fagin's outer garment, for as the Jew unbuttoned it and threw it over the back of a chair, he retired to the corner from which he had risen, wagging his tail as he went, to show that he was as well satisfied as it was in his nature to be. Well, said Sykes. Well, my dear, replied the Jew. Ah, Nancy! The latter recognition was uttered with just enough of embarrassment to imply a doubt of its reception, for Mr. Fagin and his young friend had not met since she had interfered in behalf of Oliver. All doubts upon the subject, if he had any, were speedily removed by the young lady's behavior. She took her feet off the fender, pushed back her chair, and bade Fagin draw up his, without saying more about it for it was a cold night, and no mistake. "'It is cold, Nancy, dear,' said the Jew, as he warmed his skinny hands over the fire. "'It seems to go right through one,' added the old man, touching his side. "'It must be a piercer, if it finds its way through your heart,' said Mr. Sykes. "'Give him something to drink, Nancy. Burn my body, make haste. It's enough to turn a man ill, to see his lean old carcass shivering in that way.' like an ugly ghost just rose from the grave. Nancy quickly brought a bottle from the cupboard, in which there were many, which, to judge from the diversity of their appearance, were filled with several kinds of liquids. Sykes, pouring out a glass of brandy, bade the Jew drink it off. "'Quite enough, quite, thank you, Bill,' replied the Jew, putting down the glass after just setting his lips to it. "'What? You're afraid of our getting the better of you, are you?' inquired Sykes, fixing his eyes on the Jew. Ugh! With a hoarse grunt of contempt, Mr. Sykes seized the glass and threw the remainder of its contents into the ashes. 
as a preparatory ceremony to filling it again for himself, which he did at once. The Jew glanced around the room as his companion tossed down the second glassful, not in curiosity, for he had seen it often before, but in a restless and suspicious manner habitual to him. It was a meanly furnished apartment, with nothing but the contents of the closet, to induce the belief that its occupier was anything but a working man, and with no more suspicious articles displayed to view than two or three heavy bludgeons which stood in a corner, and a life preserver that hung over the chimney piece. There, said Sykes, smacking his lips, now I'm ready. For business, inquired the Jew. For business, replied Sykes. So say what you've got to say. About the crib at Chertsey, Bill, said the Jew, drawing his chair forward and speaking in a very low voice. Yes, what about it, inquired Sykes. Ah, you know what I mean, my dear, said the Jew. He knows what I mean, Nancy, don't he? No, he don't, sneered Mr. Sykes, or he won't, and that's the same thing. Speak out and call things by their right names. Don't sit there winking and blinking and talking to me in hints as if you weren't the very first that thought about the robbery. What do you mean? Hush, Bill, hush, said the Jew, who had in vain attempted to stop this burst of indignation. Somebody will hear us, my dear. Somebody will hear us. Let him hear, said Sykes. I don't care. But as Mr. Sykes did care, on reflection, he dropped his voice as he said the words and grew calmer. There, there, said the Jew, coaxing me. It was only my caution, nothing more. Now, my dear, about that crib at Chertsey. When is it to be done, Bill, huh? When is it to be done? Such plate, my dear, such plate, said the Jew, rubbing his hands and elevating his eyebrows in a rapture of anticipation. Not at all, replied Sykes coldly. Not to be done at all? echoed the Jew, leaning back in his chair. No, nope, not at all, rejoined Sykes. At least it can't be a put-up job as we expected. Then it hasn't been properly gone about, said the Jew, turning pale with anger. Don't tell me. But I will tell you, retorted Sykes. Who are you that's not to be told? I tell you that Toby Crackett has been hanging about the place for a fortnight, and he can't get one of the servants in line. Do you mean to tell me, Bill, said the Jew, softening as the other grew heated, that neither of the two men in the house can be got over? Yes, I do mean to tell you so, replied Sykes. The old lady has had em these twenty years, and if you were to give em five hundred pound, they wouldn't be in it. But do you mean to say, my dear, remonstrated the Jew, that the women can't be got over? Not a bit of it, replied Sykes. Not by flash Toby Crackett, said the Jew incredulously. Think what women are, Bill. No. Not even by flash, Toby Crackett, replied Sykes. He said he's worn sham whiskers and a canary waistcoat the whole blessed time he's been loitering down there, and it's all of no use. He should have tried mustachios and a pair of military trousers, my dear, said the Jew. So he did, rejoined Sykes, and they weren't of no more use than the other plant. The Jew looked blank at this information. After ruminating for some minutes with his chin sunk on his breast, he raised his head and said with a deep sigh that if Flash Toby Crackett reported aright, he feared the game was up. And yet, said the old man, dropping his hands on his knees, it's a sad thing, my dear, to lose so much when we had set our hearts upon it. So it is, said Mr. Sykes, worse luck. A long silence ensued during which the Jew was plunged in deep thought, with his face wrinkled into an expression of villainy perfectly demoniacal. Sykes eyed him furtively from time to time. Nancy, apparently fearful of irritating the housebreaker, sat with her eyes fixed upon the fire, as if she had been deaf to all that passed. Figgin, said Sykes, abruptly breaking the stillness that prevailed, is it worth fifty shiners extra? "'If it's safely done from the outside?' "'Yes,' said the Jew, as suddenly rousing himself. "'Is it a bargain?' inquired Sykes. "'Yes, my dear, yes,' rejoined the Jew, "'his eyes glistening and every muscle in his face working "'with the excitement that the inquiry had awakened. "'Then,' said Sykes, "'thrusting aside the Jew's hand with some disdain, "'let it come off as soon as you like. "'Toby and me 
were over the garden wall the night afore last sounding the panels of the door and shutters the cribs barred up at night like a jail but there's one part we can crack safe and softly which is that bill asked the jew eagerly why whispered sykes as you cross the lawn yeah said the jew bending his head forward with his eyes almost starting out of it Oof, cried sykes stopping short as the girl scarcely moving her head looked suddenly round and pointed for an instant to the jew's face never mind which part it is you can't do it without me i know but it's best to be on the safe side when one deals with you as you like my dear as you like replied the jew is there no help wanted but yours and toby's none said sykes except a centre bit and a boy the first we've both got the second you must find us a boy exclaimed the jew oh then it's a panel eh never mind what it is replied sykes i want a boy and he mustn't be a big un lord said mr sykes reflectively if i'd only got that young boy of ned the chimbley sweepers he kept him small on purpose and let him out by the job but the father gets lagged and then the juvenile delinquent society comes and takes the boy away from a trade where he was earning money teaches him to read and write and in time makes apprentice of him and so they go on said mr sykes his wrath rising with the recollection of his wrongs and so they go on and if they've got money enough which it's a providence they haven't we shouldn't have half a dozen boys left in the whole trade in a year or two no more we should acquiesced the jew who had been considering during this speech and had only caught the last sentence bill what now inquired sykes the jew nodded his head towards nancy who was still gazing at the fire and intimated by a sign that he would have her told to leave the room sykes shrugged his shoulders impatiently as if he thought the precaution unnecessary but complied nevertheless by requesting miss nancy to fetch him a jug of beer you don't want any beer said nancy folding her arms and retaining her seat very composedly i tell you i do replied sykes nonsense rejoined the girl coolly go on fagin i know what he's going to say bill he needn't mind me the jew still hesitated sykes looked from one to the other in some surprise why you don't mind the old girl do you fagin he asked at length you've known her long enough to trust her or the devil's in it she ain't one to blab are you nancy i should think not replied the young lady drawing her chair up to the table and putting her elbows upon it no no my dear i know you're not said the jew but and again the old man paused but what inquired sykes i didn't know whether she mightn't perhaps be out of sorts you know my dear as she was the other night replied the jew at this confession miss nancy burst into a loud laugh and swallowing a glass of brandy shook her head with an air of defiance and burst into sundry exclamations of keep the game a-goin never say die and the like these seemed to have the effect of reassuring both gentlemen for the jew nodded his head with a satisfied air and resumed his seat as did mr sykes likewise now fagin said nancy with a laugh tell bill at once about oliver ha you're a clever one my dear the sharpest girl i ever saw said the jew patting her on the neck it was about oliver i was going to speak sure enough ha 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 what about him demanded sykes he's the boy for you my dear replied the jew in a hoarse whisper laying his finger on the side of his nose and grinning frightfully Heh! exclaimed sykes have him bill said nancy i would if i was in your place he mayn't be so much up as any of the others but that's not what you want and if he's only to open a door for you depend upon it he's a safe one bill i know he is rejoined fagin he's been in good training these last few weeks and it's time he began to work for his bread besides the others are all too big well he is just the size i want said mr sykes ruminating and we'll do everything you want bill my dear interposed the jew he can't help himself that is if you frighten him enough frighten him echoed sykes it'll be no sham frightening mind you if there's anything queer about him when we once get into the work 
In for a penny, in for a pound. You won't see him alive again, Fagin. Think of that before you send him. Mark my words, said the robber, poising a crowbar, which he had drawn from under the bedstead. I've thought of it all, said the Jew with energy. I've, I've had my eye upon him, my dears. Close, close. Once let him feel that he is one of us. Once fill his mind with the idea that he has been a thief, and he's ours. Ours for his life. Oh, it couldn't have come about better. The old man crossed his arms upon his breast, and drawing his head and shoulders into a heap, literally hugged himself for joy. Ours, said Sykes. Yours, you mean. Perhaps I do, my dear, said the Jew, with a shrill chuckle. Mine, if you like, Bill. And what, said Sykes, scowling fiercely on his agreeable friend, what makes you take so much pains about one chalk-faced kid, when you know there are fifty boys snoozing about common garden every night, as you might pick and choose from? Because they're of no use to me, my dear, replied the Jew, with some confusion. Not worth the taking. Their looks come victim when they get into trouble, and I lose them all. With this boy, properly managed, my dears, I could do what I couldn't with twenty of them. Besides, said the Jew, recovering his self-possession, he has us now if he could only give us leg bail again. And he must be in the same boat with us. Never mind how he came there. It's quite enough for my power over him that he was in a robbery. That's all I want. Now, how much better this is than being obliged to put the poor little boy out of the way, which would be dangerous, and we should lose by it beside. When is it to be done? asked Nancy, stopping some turbulent exclamation on the part of Mr. Sykes, expressive of the disgust with which he received Fagin's affectation of humanity. Ah, to be sure, said the Jew. When is it to be done, Bill? I planned with Toby the night after tomorrow, rejoined Sykes in a surly voice. If he heard nothing from me to the contrary. Good, said the Jew. There's no moon. No, rejoined Sykes. It's all arranged about bringing off the swag, is it? asked the Jew. Sykes nodded. And about... Oh, ah, uh, it's all planned, rejoined Sykes, interrupting him. Never mind particulars. You'd better bring the boy here tomorrow night. I shall get off the stone an hour after daybreak. Then you hold your tongue and keep the melting pot ready, and that's all you'll have to do. After some discussion, in which all three took an active part, it was decided that Nancy should repair to the Jews next evening when the night had set in, and bring Oliver away with her. Fagin craftily observing that, if he evinced any disinclination to the task, he would be more willing to accompany the girl who had so recently interfered in his behalf than anybody else. It was also solemnly arranged that poor Oliver should, for the purposes of the contemplated expedition, be unreservedly consigned to the care and custody of Mr. William Sykes, and further, that the said Sykes should deal with him as he thought fit, and should not be held responsible by the Jew for any mischance or evil that might be necessary to visit him. It being understood that, to render the compact in this respect binding, any representations made by Mr. Sykes on his return should be required to be confirmed and corroborated in all important particulars by the testimony of Flash Toby Crackett. These preliminaries adjusted, Mr. Sykes proceeded to drink brandy at a furious rate and to flourish the crowbar in an alarming manner, yelling forth at the same time most unmusical snatches of song mingled with wild execrations. At length, in a fit of professional enthusiasm, he insisted upon producing his box of housebreaking tools, which he had no sooner stumbled in with and opened for the purpose of explaining the nature and properties of the various implements it contained, and the peculiar beauties of their construction, then he fell over the box upon the floor and went to sleep where he fell. Good night, Nancy, said the Jew, muffling himself up as before. Good night. Their eyes met, and the Jew scrutinized her merrily. There was no flinching about the girl. She was as true and earnest in the matter as Toby Crackett himself could be. The Jew again bade her good night and bestowing a sly kick upon the 
prostrate form of Mr. Sykes, while her back was turned, roped downstairs. Always the way, muttered the Jew to himself as he turned homeward. The worst of these women is that a very little thing serves to call up some long-forgotten feeling, and the best of them is that it never lasts. <laughs> the man against the child for a bag of gold. Beguiling the time with these pleasant reflections, Mr. Fagin wended his way through mud and mire to his gloomy abode, where the dodger was sitting up, impatiently awaiting his return. "'Is Oliver abed? I want to speak to him,' was his first remark as they descended the stairs. "'Hours ago,' replied the dodger, throwing open a door. "'Here he is.' The boy was lying fast asleep on a rude bed upon the floor, so pale with anxiety and sadness and the closeness of his prison that he looked like death. Not death as it shows in shroud and coffin, but in the guise it wears when life has just departed, when a young and gentle spirit has, but an instant, fled to heaven, and the gross air of the world has not had time to breathe upon the changing dust it hallowed. Not now, said the Jew, turning softly away. Tomorrow, tomorrow. End of chapter 19